subcommittee will come to order. Good morning and welcome. Today we meet in open session to receive testimony on the fiscal year 2010 budget request for shipbuilding programs. Appearing before us today are the Chief Acquisition Officer of the Navy, the Honorable Sean Stackley, the Chief's Requirements Officer of the Navy, Admiral, Vice Admiral Barry McCullough. Admiral, you're well known to this committee and welcome back. Secretary Stackley, while many of us know you and have worked with you in the past, we believe this is the first time that you're going to have <clears throat> that you will testify before this committee and, and welcome. The good news is that we are not going to be interrupted by votes because the House stands in recess. It's my hope that this will allow us to have a frank and detailed discussion on where we are, where we need to go with our shipbuilding programs. Thank the members in attendance for staying in town to participate in this very important hearing. In previous years at this hearing, I've commented that the budget request and the accompanying 30-year shipbuilding plans were unachievable. In fact, I've stated that the long-range plan was pure fantasy. It now appears that the Navy has learned how to deflect criticism of the shipbuilding plan. They don't submit one. Another requirement, although required by Title X of the United States Code, all plans for future years ship procurement are being withheld from the Congress. This obviously makes it very difficult for the members of Congress to fulfill the Article I obligations to provide and maintain a Navy. I realize the two witnesses sitting before this committee today did not make that decision, and I will not continue to dwell on the subject. But I state for the public record that the failure of the Department to describe the future shipbuilding plan will not prevent this subcommittee from doing due diligence required in recommending to the full committee and to the full House a shipbuilding plan which will restore the Navy to an acceptable number of ships, which will preserve the domestic industrial capacity for the construction of warships. I'll say that again. If the Navy chooses not to submit a shipbuilding plan to Congress, Congress will provide one for the Navy. In the limited time the subcommittee has to review this year's budget request, it appears to be somewhat better <clears throat> than in previous years. The Department is requesting authorization for the procurement of eight new ships and is requesting advanced procurement funds for the procurement of at least seven more next year, including two submarines. If you take into account that the littoral combat ship program and the joint high-speed vessel do not require advanced procurement, then the potential exists for a 12-ship request next year. I have the following concerns, which I trust that our witnesses will address today. None of these should come as a surprise, particularly to our two witnesses, since I have expressed these concerns either publicly or directly to them. I'm concerned about the EMOS program for the next aircraft carrier. As the Secretary well knows, I recently visited the production facility and I was favorably impressed. However, failure of this one system to deliver on its promises means that we are building the world's largest helicopter carrier. I'd like the Secretary to address what additional oversight and continuality of oversight envisions for the program. Also remain very concerned about the LCS program. I am not happy with either the cost or scheduled performance. In January, I spoke with the captain of the first ship and to the credit of the shipbuilder, he is, he is pleased with the ship and I'm happy he's pleased with the ship. But the fact remains that the ship was delivered 18 months late and two and a half times over the cost that the contractor promised. No one, either the Navy or the contractor, should be patting themselves on the back for the first ship or for the second ship, which has still not been delivered. I'm not convinced that the costs are being properly monitored by the Navy. These ships are too expensive. We need to drive the cost down and or we need to see who can build these ships for a fair price. I think it's important to note that everyone about this program is different from other shipbuilding programs. The D Navy does not contract with the shipyards building the ship. They have agreements with two prime contractors. The ship's propulsion systems, combat systems, and C4I systems were not specified by the Navy. They were chosen by the prime contractors to meet performance specifications. Because of this, there is very little common equipment between the two types of ships. Lack of commonality costs money now, it will increase training cost for the sailor, and it will increase overall life cycle cost. 
I request that the Admiral and the Secretary address this issue lacking cop commonality today. Turning to the destroyer program, it's no secret that this committee last year supported the CNO's desire to return to the construction of the DDG-51 destroyer. Not everyone is happy with the final decision. but We seem to now have a final decision for the Secretary of Defense on the way forward and an agreement between the two shipyards which will level the industrial load. I request the Secretary explain the agreements and I re request the Admiral give us some sense of how he will use these both two very different types of destroyers. I would also like an explanation this morning to some fairly significant funding requests in the research and development accounts. The Secretary of Defense has testified that future procurement decisions will be based on the results of the Quadrennial Defense Review and has stated that as, as the reason to re not request funds to alleviate shortfalls and validate requirements, gaps, such as the current strike fighter shortfall of the FNA 18s. Yet the Department is requesting one half of a billion dollars for the development efforts for replacement of Ohio class submarine before the QDR validates the requirement. Make no mistake, this subcommittee has been the strongest proponent over the last three years in the submarine construction and the preservation of our nation's submarine industrial base. The subcommittee has been supportive of pulling forward the design of the next generation submarine to ensure we do not lose our skill of edge design workforce. Yet this request goes far beyond that goal. I ask the witnesses to please explain why the subcommittee should recommend the full request for a non-validated requirement when there is very real shortfalls in other validated requirements today. These are a few of our concerns. I'm sure the other members will express theirs. Again, I welcome the Secretary. I welcome the Admiral for being with us. I now turn to my friend from Missouri, the ranking member, Mr. Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good morning to our witnesses. Had the opportunity to meet with Admiral McCullough for the first time yesterday. Have another good discussion with Secretary uh, uh, Stackley uh, also in our office. I'd like to thank you again for taking time to answer my questions and to share your thoughts regarding some of the shipbuilding programs proposed in this year's budget. I was also interested to hear that the Chief of Naval Operations state yesterday at the full committee hearing that the Navy still intends to maintain the 313 ships. It had begun to sound as if the Secretary of Defense in his Foreign Affairs article and the Navy in its budget rollout were beginning to back away from that number. It was not clear to me how the Navy planned to implement the joint maritime strategy with its emphasis on forward presence if the Navy intended to accept fewer ships. A ship can only be in one place at one time, and today's fleet is the smallest it's been for nearly 100 years. Despite the good news, however, that the Navy is not backing away from the goal of increasing the size of the fleet, the CNO also acknowledged in his written statement for fiscal year 2010 budget aligns with the path of our maritime strategy has set However, we're progressing at an adjusted pace. That sounds like code to me for this budget request doesn't invalidate our maritime strategy, but it won't allow us to meet our goals. I see evidence of this in the budget request for shipbuilding. For example, the Navy will commission and decommission the same number of ships this year, which means no net increase to the number of ships. To be fair, it can't blame that uh, on the budget request, but the simple math, 300 ships with an average 30-year life means that we need to commission and decommission about 10 <coughs> ships a year. And this budget requests only eight ships and presents no future plan to give Congress any reason to believe the Navy will ever meet its force structure requirements. Our colleague, Representative Forbes, asked Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullen about the lack of a 30-year shipbuilding plan at a hearing earlier this week, Admiral Mullen stated, it will come in the 11 budget, and I would say we can rely reasonably well on the 30-year shipbuilding plan that has been submitted before. But I count at least nine ways this budget diverges from the 09 plan. One, moving the funding of carriers to five-year centers drops the force to 10 carriers by 2039. Two, building three DDG-1000 destroyers instead of seven. Three, building one DDG-51 destroyer instead of zero. Not building the next generation cruiser. Not building a large deck and fib for the uh, maritime uh, pre-positioning force in 10. 
not building a mobile landing platform ship for the maritime prepositioning force in 010. And then seven, not shutting down the LPD-17 production line at nine ships, but funding the final increment for the 10th ship. Uh, and nine, building two TAKE ships for 10 instead of zero, and investing half a billion dollars in R&D for the replacement of the Ohio-class submarines. So in fact, we cannot rely upon the last shipbuilding plan, and evidently we don't receive a new one. We have the same problems on the av aviation front, but I'll save those comments for next week's aviation hearing. Therefore, we can only rely on the testimony you provide today to shed light on the analysis that went into the decisions that were made within the shipbuilding account. The investments that the Navy is making in ship construction and R&D were evidently a higher priority than addressing the strike fighter gap, which until recently the Navy said was a serious concern. This may be true, but to do our jobs, it becomes critically important that this committee understand your reasoning. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, to our witnesses. I appreciate your being with us today and truly look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. Chair now recognizes the Secretary, Mr. Stackley. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Representative Aiken, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to address Navy shipbuilding. If it's acceptable to the committee, I would propose to keep my opening remarks brief and submit a formal statement for the record. Uh, without objection, but, but Mr. Stackley, I also want to inform you that although it is the norm for the full committee to limit witnesses for five minutes, please take whatever time you feel is necessary. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Today's Navy is a fleet of 283 battle force ships, as many as half of which may be underway on any given day, supporting combat <laughs> operations, building global partnerships, providing international security, performing humanitarian assistance and disaster response, prosecuting piracy, testing future capabilities and training for future operations. Beyond numbers, the quality of the force, our ships, aircraft, weapon systems, and most importantly, our sailors and Marines, is unmatched at sea. So it'd be easy to take comfort in knowing that for the next decade and certainly beyond, the Navy and Marine Corps stand ready to respond to major conflict with the most capable naval warfare systems in the world today. The events of this century, however, point to our future and must increasingly contend with irregular and asymmetric threats. And two, we must cap pace the capabilities of rogue states and emerging naval powers that would intend to challenge our influence and the regional security of our friends and allies. In the face of these growing challenges, the Chief of Naval Operations has outlined requirements for the future force, the 313-ship Navy. In fact, the CNO has emphasized that 313 ships represents the floor if we are to meet the full range of missions confronting the Navy the next decade and beyond. The FY 2010 budget request funds eight ships, a modest but important step forward towards meeting the CNO's requirements. Again, however, it's more than numbers. The Navy is moving to close gaps in our capabilities. To this end, we will restart the DGG-51 construction in 2010 to provide increased air and missile defense to meet the demand from combatant commanders. The success of the Aegis system against ballistic missiles demonstrated through at-sea testing and two, through real-world performance against an earthbound satellite provides a solid foundation for this mission. At the other end of the warfare spectrum, we are increasing production of the littoral combat ship with our request to deliver this needed capability to the fleet. We know there are many challenges ahead as we ramp up construction, tackle affordability, and learn how to best operate and support this new class. But we're confident that the utility and the flexibility of this ship will prove indispensable in future naval operations. This year's request also includes the 12th Virginia class fast attack submarine and two TAKE dry cargo and ammunition ships. Each of these are strongly performing programs. The eighth ship in our request is one of two joint high speed vessels that the Navy is jointly procuring with the Army. The budget request also funds the balance of LPD 26 and DDG 1002 and includes advanced procurement for seven future ships. 
The underlying challenge, indeed the pressing requirement before us today, is affordability. This is not a new challenge, but it has taken on new dimensions. The fact is that ship costs are rising faster than our top line. Per ship costs have risen due to such factors as low rate production, reduced competition, increased system complexity, build rate volatility, instability in ship class size, and challenges with introducing new technologies into new platforms. Perhaps most significantly, over the past decade, we have introduced 11 new class designs, 11 lead ships, each a highly complex prototype bringing its own unique challenges. And then compounding these issues, particularly in the case of lead ships, where there is greater risk and uncertainty, we have fallen short on our ship cost estimates, or in certain cases, on our willingness and ability to fully fund to the estimate. All of these factors lead to inefficient production and cost growth. We have learned, or in certain cases relearned, the lessons of this experience. Accordingly, the Navy understands and agrees with the objectives of the House Bill on Acquisition Reform, and we strive to meet its spirit and intent in our ongoing initiatives to raise the standards to improve the processes, to instill necessary discipline, and to strengthen the, the professional core that manages our major defense acquisition programs. And to this end, the 2010 Navy Shipbuilding Plan strives to provide stability, which should underpin improved performance across government and industry. The budget request builds on ship programs which are currently in serial production. There is renewed emphasis on mini minimizing change to requirements, minimizing change to design, and improving our estimates for follow ships. This leads to reducing risk to the shipyard's ability to execute follow-on vessels, enabling the Navy to expand the use of fixed-price type contracts. We're committed to ensuring that new ship designs are mature enough to commence production. We are working to fully leverage competition at every level of our shipbuilding programs recognizing at the prime there are often limited competitions, but we're drilling down to the first and second tier vendors as well. Within our shipbuilding contracts, we're implementing affordability programs, reuse of existing design, and incentives for selected industrial capital investments and improvement projects, as well open architecture, both for hardware and software, promises to be a powerful cost avoidance tool as well as a process for improving our warfighting capability. The challenge before us is great, but so is the need. And in meeting the need, this subcommittee has been steadfast and unwavering in its support for a strong Navy and Marine Corps. We thank you for that. And again, I thank you for your time today and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Admiral McCullough. Chairman Taylor, Representative Aiken, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to appear before you this morning with Secretary Stackley to discuss Navy shipbuilding. I request a written statement be made a part of the record. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, before I begin, I'd like to mention that in addition to our role in sea power, the Navy currently has more than 13,000 Navy personnel serving on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. They serve in traditional roles with the Marine Corps, but also in support of the land service, combat support, and combat service support, in support of joint commands and the Army. We provide these sailors in addition to fulfilling our commitments to the country and our allies to provide persistent forward presence and credible combat power in support of the maritime strategy. Today we have a balanced fleet capable of meeting most combating commander demands, from persistent presence to counter piracy to ballistic missile defense. Right now, we have 40,000 sailors deployed aboard 124 ships and submarines around the world as part of our ever-deployed force. However, as we look ahead in the balance of capability and capacity, we are seeing emerging warfighting requirements in open ocean anti-submarine warfare, anti-ship cruise missile, and theater ballistic missile defense. Gaps in these warfare areas pose increased risk to our forces. State and non-state actors who in the past 
have only posed limited threats in the littoral are expanding their reach beyond their shores and with improved warfighting capabilities. A number of countries who historically have only possessed regional military capabilities are investing in their navies to extend their reach and influence as they, complete for, as they compete for global markets. Our Navy needs to outpace other Navy's capabilities as they extend their reach. The Navy must be able to assure access in undeveloped theaters. We have routinely had access to forward staging bases in the past. This may not always be the case as we go forward. In order to align our surface combatant investment strategy to best meet evolving warfighting gaps, our FY10 budget request truncates the DDG-1000 program at three ships and restarts the DDG-51 production line. This plan best aligns our surface combatant investment strategy to meet Navy and combatant commander warfighting needs. The Navy must have the right capacity to meet combatant commander warfighting requirements and remain a global deterrent. Combatant commanders continue to request more ships and increased presence to expand cooperation with new partners in Africa, the Black Sea, the Baltic region, and the Indian Ocean. This is in addition to the presence required to maintain our relationships with current allies and partners. The Navy can always be persistently present in areas of our choosing. We lack the capacity to be persistently present globally. This pr creates a, present, a presence deficit, if we will, where we are unable to meet combatant commander demands. Africa command capacity demands will not mitigate the growing European command requirement. And Southern Command has consistently required more presence that goes largely unfilled. The Navy remains committed to procuring 55 littoral combat ships. The LCS program will deliver capabilities to close validated warfighting gaps. LCS's inherent speed, agility, shallow draft, payload capacity, and reconfigurable mission spaces provides an ideal platform for conducting additional missions in support of the maritime strategy to include irregular warfare, maritime security, and anti-piracy operations. The Navy remains committed to an 11 carrier force for the next three decades, which is necessary to ensure that we can respond to national crises with the currently presently described timelines. Our carrier force provides the nation the unique ability to overcome political and geographic barriers to access for all missions and project power ashore without the need for host nation ports and airfields. The Ohio class ballistic submarine originally designed for a 30-year service life, will start retiring in 2027 after over 40 years of service life. The Navy commenced an analysis of alternatives in FY08 for a replacement SSBN. Early research and development will set the stage for the first ship to begin construction in FY 2019. This timeline is consistent with the development of the Ohio class. The Virginia-class submarine is a multi-mission platform that fulfills full-spectrum requirements. Virginia was designed to dominate the undersea domain in the littorals as well as in the open ocean in today's challenging security environment. And it's replacing our aging 688-class submarines. Now in its 10th year of construction, the Virginia program is demonstrating that this critical capability can be delivered affordably and on time. In this budget request, we have delayed the start of the follow-on cruiser program known as CGX. This requirement has been validated by the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, and the JROC approved the initial capabilities document. However, this system is dependent on development of certain aspects of the ballistic missile defense system, total architecture, specifically sensors and sensor netting. Thus, the analysis of alternatives remains in Navy staffing until we better understand the required sensors for this platform and our ability to deliver that capability. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has determined that a minimum of 33 assault echelon ships is necessary to support Marine Corps lift requirements. Specifically, as re he has requested a force of 11 aviation-capable ships, 11 LPD-17s, and 11 LSDs. Chief of Naval Operations support the Commandant's requirement. However, this requirement, as well as the CGX requirement, will be further reviewed by the Department during the Quadrennial Defense Review. 
The Navy must maintain its carrier submarine and amphibious forces. In addition, we need to increase our surface combatant capacity with additional destroyers and LCS to meet combatant commander needs today and for ballistic missile defense, theater security cooperation, and the steady state security posture of the future. I thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Navy's shipbuilding program and your support of our Navy. I look forward to answering your questions, and again, thank you very much for your support to the Navy. Admiral, thanks for your comments, and above all, thanks for your many years of service to our nation. I'm going to turn to Mr. Aiken. I didn't have any uh, specific, well, actually, I could, could run through a couple different things here. The, the first one is um, the uh, DDG-51. Uh, last year, the Navy was criticized for proposing to restart the DDG-51 line without having revalidated the requirement through the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. In your opinion, was that necessary, or if have you done so, or is it not really necessary? Uh, we took uh, the DDG-51 uh, brief to the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. Uh, there were specific questions about what drove the change, and the change was driven uh, by our evaluation of changing threats globally. Uh, and this was conveyed to the JROC, specifically the development of anti-ship ballistic missile capability uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, the proliferation of uh, ballistic missiles globally, uh, the improved uh, uh, capability <coughs> in non-state actors, uh, specifically demonstrated by Hezbollah in the 2006 war with Israel, uh, when Hezbollah launched two C-802 uh, coastal defense cruise missiles, uh, one striking the Israeli ship Hanat and the other striking a merchant vessel. Uh, so from an uh, area air de defense perspective and an anti-ballistic missile defense perspective, we saw a rapid uh, increase in development of threat capability and the proliferation of this capability. Additionally, uh, we've been monitoring submarine deployments of potential adversaries in the Pacific uh, and have noted uh, an increase in deployment uh, numbers and times uh, of that potential av adversary out into uh, areas east of Taiwan. Uh, these are not with previously noted noisy uh, type submarines, but with increasingly quiet uh, advanced uh, diesel electric submarines with anti-ship um, uh, cruise missile capability. When we looked at uh, the development of the threat and the fact that uh, development of that threat had moved to the left, uh, we found it increasingly necessary to increase our capability and capacity in those areas. Uh, this goes hand in hand with the capability that we've developed uh, in a DDG-51 class ship. Uh, there are those that would say that is older technology and I would say that the capability we put in DDG-112 is substantially uh, uh, much better from a capability standpoint than what was originally put in the Arleigh Burke in, 19, uh, or in the early 1990s. Uh, early Burke DDG-51's first deployment was in uh, 1991. Uh, when we looked that, at the is cap that capability that you're talking about stronger in terms of the ballistic defense or also submarine, anti-submarine? Uh, open ocean anti-submarine warfare in the case of the uh, Arleigh Burke destroyers is, uh, is, is much better. The Arleigh Burke uh, has a, uh, a much more powerful uh, active sonar, uh, and that was by design. The DDG-1000 has a lower power sonar, uh, but that's uh, required in literal operations, uh, specifically in a, reverber a reverberation environment. Uh, the DDG-1000 ship uh, is an excellent ship for what we asked uh, the designers to design and the shipbuilders to build but it does not answer the threats we see today in uh, anti-ballistic missile defense, uh, cruise missile defense, uh, and open ocean anti-submarine warfare. And that's why we made the change, sir. And uh, one other question then. Um, my understanding is the Navy intends to spend $1.6 to complete R&D on uh, DDG-1000. And that may have benefits for future platforms such as a CVN-78, <coughs> Uh, the Ford class carrier and help the industrial base, but since DDG 1000 provides a capability that is less valuable to the Navy in the future, can you tell me if the Navy has considered sacrificing some of that capability in order to save the money for R&D or procurement or could be applied elsewhere? Sir, if I could take that question. Yeah. 
Uh, let, let me break down the R&D uh, elements of DDG-1000 into a couple categories. Uh, first, you have an R&D stream that goes for the total platform that regardless of uh, the, the quantity that you build, if you're going to build one, we have to complete the uh, design development for the class. There's a second R&D stream that goes to supporting completion of development of major systems such as the dual band radar, the advanced gun system, that again, if you're going to field one DDG-1000, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to invest in those dollars. That overhead. And then the dual band radar as well goes to the carrier program, so that, that stream would, would stay in place. But there are, there are significant opportunities to improve on the total dollars, particularly, particularly when we take a look at uh, some of the T&E requirements. The T&E program for DDG-1000 is extremely robust, and I'm working with the program office right now. We're, we're basically going line by line, tracing requirements, uh, uh, program requirements, platform requirements, system requirements, to test requirements, and uh, basically looking to be able to harvest some of those opportunities. Those aren't in the near years. You don't get heavy into T&E until the, the out years, but we're attacking it. And I'd be happy to, uh, at the right time, uh, uh, return to the, the subcommittee here and, and give you greater insight into both the opportunities and the approach we're taking. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. Secretary Stackley, the, um, and again, you are you're fairly new to the job. When we express our disappointment in the Navy's failure to articulate a shipbuilding plan, uh, you just happen to be the one to get the message. Yes, sir. Today. Please. And, Without the Navy articulating the plan, let me tell you what I think is the plan. Apparently, one of the centerpieces will be, as, you, as the Admiral mentioned, a very large purchase of LCSs. The LCS was, uh, when the Navy came to Congress and said they wanted the ship, the centerpiece of it was it was going to be an affordable warship. When the price grows from 220 to 500 or 600 or 700 million per ship, uh, to use the analogy that the Secretary of Defense did the other day uh, on a smaller aircraft, when it starts getting in the league, same price late range as a DDG-51, and it's about one-fifth the capability, then something's wrong. I'm going to ask you for the record, what is your target price for the follow-on vessels in the LCS program starting with the 7th and 8th? Uh, yes, sir. Now, the 2010 budget is requesting the fifth, sixth. I understand. And, yes, sir. Very good. That's, that's why, and again, I realize it's going to continue to be a learning curve on the part of the manufacturer. So what is your target price? Since we have a goal of about 50 of these vessels, what's your target price for the 7th and 8th? Yes, sir. Let me, uh, let me describe uh, uh, two pieces. Okay. One is budget, and the other is target price because the target price would be our contract price with uh, the contractors for delivering the ship. And then beyond that, we have additional budget requirements associated with government, associated with integrated logistics support. Let's These leave other it to costs. the cost of the ship. I understand the, the additional packages. Yes, sir. So we have taken the $460 million cost cap, and we've used that, uh, I'll call it as a forcing function, in terms of driving to that number because that's not where we are today. So the, the numbers that you quoted, the 700 number, that would be a total budget number Stand. for the first two ships. Uh, we have come down measurably going from the first two to ships three and four, and we look to make uh, uh, about equal strides in ships five, six, and seven with the 2010. That means we have not hit 460 for total program, but we're targeting 460 for, as you describe it, a target price. Okay. Secondly, if um, again, I and I was an early convert to Admiral Roughhead's decision to end the DDG 1000 program, go back to the 51s, I'm in total agreement. Since that is apparently going to be our warship of choice for the foreseeable future. What steps are you taking for a multi-year procurement contract to, again, get the best economies that the nation can get on this warship? Yes, sir. And if I could combine this with uh, your opening statement uh, with regards to the uh, agreement with industry, what we're doing as a part of that agreement 
is um, we've made the decision that we're going to restart at one location at Northrop Grumman Ingalls operation and uh, by making that decision we're coupling it with investments in terms of production planning and in terms of yardwide improvements to facilitate not just restarting not just building like they built the last DDG 51 off the line but let's look forward at ways to significantly improve the way we bring this ship together look long term get off to a good start those two ships are in the 2010 and we project 2011 budget request if you will and my my target is to be able to move back into multi-year procurements in 12 and out that's a target we have to work this through the 2011 process we're going to have to be able to come back to you all to demonstrate that we are going to be able to achieve the significant savings as well we're going to have to put together an economic order quantity advanced procurement plan that would start with funding in 2011 as well uh, at, at the uh, Bath Iron Works they will get their first DDG 51 their equivalent of a restart 2012 they would be competing with Northrop Grumman in a multi-year environment that's that's my goal okay thirdly is uh, it's been my observation and I will use the LCS program as the poster child of a program gone horribly wrong for years mr. Bartlett the previous chairman and ranking member and I would get reports from captain or admiral one after another everything's fine it's on time it's on budget and then within a week or two of the uh, change to where the Democrats got control of Congress another admiral comes into my office and it's literally a all shucks moment we've cut the main reduction gear backwards everything's wrong and things really spun out of control on the program part of that problem I think was that the officer in charge of the program the baton would be passed to use a better analogy about once a year and every one of those officers left and said everything's fine we can't afford mistakes like that anymore as I, as I spoke on the emails program the electromagnetic launch on the next carrier if it fails and I support your decision to go with it but if it fails it is not a joke we have taken what should have been a seven billion dollar aircraft carrier and we now have a seven billion dollar helicopter carrier no one wants that to happen it is my intention to recommend to the committee as a part of our markup to tell the Navy in our markup that you should appoint an officer who's going to be in charge of that program from today through the development of the prototype then tell the Navy that after that prototype is developed and accepted by the Navy a second officer will be in charge of the development of the prototype to delivery of the vessel by the United States Navy in approximately five to seven years what would be your reaction to that um, let me describe that the program manager who is currently responsible for emails is top-notch he's one of our one of our superstars and at this critical stage in the program I've separately determined that he needs to stay until we complete system development and demonstration and so uh, we we are on that path so what what you are proposing is what we are doing what about for the second half uh, likewise sir um, uh, we're looking at timing we want to be able to bring on uh, the relief for the current program manager and give him more than two weeks turnover actually start to lay the groundwork because his focus is going to be on transitioning from the design development to the uh, ship installation and integration um, and it's a little bit longer than a normal rotation if you will uh, we're gonna have to work that work that hard but we see the value and the, the importance in criticality okay well again I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're in agreement I think it makes perfect sense to put it in the law since people come and go we need to see to it that the law remains steady and that the program is again that uh, it's done right and I want you to know that I do support your decision to go the emails but we want to make sure we get it right having said that the chair recognizes the gentleman from I'm sorry Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Stackley, 
General Dynamics NASCO in San Diego, uh, according to the, the Navy's view, is doing really well with their uh, TAKE. The, the uh, cost is going down. They're on schedule. I mean, it's a pretty amazing job that they're doing. Um, I know that uh, funding for the last two planned ships in the TAKE program, 13 and 14, are in this year's budget. And there's $120 million in advanced pro procurement funding and some uh, R&D funding also requested toward the MLP, which represents a, a critical capability to the Marine Corps. And it's also NASCO's nearest term ship that they're going to be building after the uh, uh, TAKEs. Secretary Gates announced last month that the procurement of the, of the first MLP ship was going to be deferred to 011, um, as would the pro procurement of the 11th LPD-17 ship pending the QDR, even though, from what I understand with the Navy, they wanted the MLP funded uh, in 010. So the uh, question is, do you agree that we need to do what we can to make sure that there's not a, a production gap between the TAE, TAKE and the MLP, which there would be with only $120 million? Uh, from what I understand, that that's not going to be enough to, to sustain the shipbuilder in, in between 010 and, and when the MLP starts being produced, there's going to be a gap there. And, and, and to add on to that, too, with what's going on in the general economy, this is kind of just a broad question, I would think that, uh, that the Navy and, 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 uh, and you especially, Mr. Secretary, would be more intent on letting the administration know what shipbuilding does for the local economies. And we're, we are, I mean, it creates jobs, it helps out the economy in general. They hire American workers and make an American product. They buy American steel, and uh, I, I think that that ties in with the with the entire uh, state of the American economy. And uh, if you lobbied harder, maybe we might be able to get some of this stuff done. And you know, this th this creates jobs. Anyway, back to the MLP, please. Yes, sir. Let me uh, let me describe the the couple components there first. T A K E. <coughs> The TAKEs that are being uh, requested in the 2010 budget, um, those were originally, in terms of the contract, there was a 2010 option, a 2011 option. And then in terms of the budget, what we see here is an opportunity to uh, improve cost on those contracts by a joint buy, buying two ships in the same year. So there is an economic decision, if you will. Uh, we're looking at savings of $170 million the way we have uh, programmed in the TAKEs two ships in the 2010 budget request. So that helps stabilize the shipyard, uh, that helps stabilize the vendor base, um, um, and it also meets our phase one MPFF uh, requirement. So that's, that's the logic and, and justification for bringing two TAKEs into 2010. The MLP program, on the other hand, uh, was originally intended to have been a uh, a competed program, and in fact, when we went through the competition process, we found ourselves quickly in a sole source. So we were able to improve on the schedule, if you will, to get to a contract, and are marching down the R&D line and the uh, design development for MLP with NASCO in that sole source environment. But we did not see a contract award prior to the fourth quarter of 2010 in that schedule. Right, but what I'm talking about is the R and R and D, the 120 million that's that's being put out there now. Yes, sir. To keep them going for all of their design changes, they're they're uh, reducing uh, risk, trying to make sure that this, you know, for once they're actually doing it right, where they're they're trying to get risk down, get everything done early, get engineering done early on it, get everything designed so that when they actually start making it, they're not a bunch of changes along the way, and then everything skyrockets like the LCS. So they're they're actually doing it the the uh, the right way. What, what I'm saying is uh, there's not enough money in, in there in that, in that uh, 120 for them to sustain between the TAKE and the MLP. There's a gap there that, that, that's going to end up costing them more down the line, costing the Navy more down the line, because they're going to have a gap in their shipbuilding. Now, it's not an incredible amount of money that they'll need. I, I'm not sure what it is, but there is a gap there when it comes to what they're going to be getting between the TAKE and the MLP. Yes, sir, to try to uh, tack on top of that. 120 million of R&D that goes to the shipbuilder, primarily to the shipbuilder for his design development for MLP. It also includes advanced procurement to lead the ship construction. We did not see a ship construction contract, though, based on the design development schedule before the fourth quarter of 10. There is a potential gap right now, 
looking at the workload at NASCO. We never like seeing a production gap at our shipyards. But given the, the choices between TAKE and MLP, timing, potential savings, we believe the right answer is put in advanced procurement to try to take care of the upfront activities that, so they can move quickly into a construction contract if, as a result of the QDR, we request a, uh, a MLP in 2011. It will be staged to minimize any potential gap between TAK and Wasn't MLP. Was the MLP already slated for 2010? The MLP was originally asked for for 2010 by the Navy. In, in the 2009 uh, budget request, right. so when you look in the 2010 column, you would see an MLP. You would yes, see sir. MLP. So yes, that was sir. slated for then, and, and then it was, it was pushed off to 2011. So, okay, I understand what you're saying. I think you're making the wrong decision though, by leaving that, that uh, gap there. If the Navy originally wanted it then, it's, it's being pushed off and it is going to produce that gap. You, you could potentially see thousands of, of jobs lost, literally, um, and, and then you're also going to see production suffer in the future for the MLP based on, on that gap that exists between the TAKE and the MLP. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman from California. We now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to focus for a minute on the Ohio uh, research and development uh, request. Uh, again, in your opening remarks, uh, Mr. Starkey, uh, there was a comment that um, ship designs must be appreciably complete before the start of fabrication to avoid concurrency and rework, which Mr. Hunter referred to in his, his comments, is that trying to get the design done and finished so that you don't um, have to change in, in mid-construction uh, seems to be a new sort of mantra here. And uh, I mean, that's given the fact that the Ohio's are going to be coming offline, uh, as the Admiral said, in 2027, and the construction is targeted for 2019. I mean, that's the point here, isn't it, to, to get the R&D and design work started so that we won't have that kind of um, difficulty? Uh, yes, sir. The uh, What's referred to as the sea-based strategic deterrent, which is the Ohio class replacement program uh, uh, boat, if you will, uh, we're targeting 2019 procurement. And uh, the R&D preceding that procurement uh, includes request in 2010. That R&D um, uh, targets a couple of things primarily. What's, one is what's referred to as the common missile compartment. The U.S. and the U.K. are jointly developing a common missile compartment that will support both our requirements as well as the U.K.'s uh, successor class which will replace the Vanguard. Uh, this is rather unique that the UK is ahead of the United States in terms of its requirements because the successor class is due uh, basically initial operation, operational capability in 2024. So they're three years ahead of us in terms of need. Uh, we are going to develop this uh, uh, jointly. So in fact, our R&D is a bit ahead of uh, historical R&D streams. So approximately uh, 387 million of our 495 requests goes towards that joint development with the UK. The balance of the request going to the front end of uh, design and feasibility studies for a new reactor plant design for this new boat. Well, just um, one question is that, you know, the SSGNs are going to start coming offline probably pretty soon after the Ohio. Um, and I, I guess the question, if we're going to, you know, invest in this early research and development, and we've got SSGN sort of right next in line in terms of coming off um, uh, use. Uh, should we maybe be focusing a little broader than just the SSBN in terms of R&D? Or I mean, it, I, I don't know what you have any comment on that. Uh, so what I what I'd say about that is, uh, you know, we just uh, completed the first deployment with Ohio. Uh, and initial indications are that submarine did exceptionally well in performing its missions and what it was tasked to do. Uh, but we're still trying to get our arms around what a, what a follow-on strategy for SSGN and what the operational requirements would be. Uh, now, that, that, that said, uh, as we go forward uh, with an Ohio replacement, uh, we need to, to look at uh, what else we could potentially use that submarine for and what it could be adapted to to, to go into an SSGN replacement. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to be very conscious uh, of what the potential cost of that submarine will be. 
and uh, if you just do the inflation from an Ohio, uh, it, it would be a substantial piece of our uh, shipbuilding budget uh, if you just inflated the cost of the original Ohio boat in the, in the uh, 2015 timeframe. And so uh, uh, there'll be a nuclear posture review, and I know there's a lot of discussion about that, but I can't see any uh, decrease in requirement for uh, the sea base part of the, the strategic triad. Uh, you might see uh, some reduction in the number of tubes required, but I don't see uh, a reduction in that requirement. Uh, and so uh, we, we have to look at both what we see coming out of the uh, SSGNs uh, as operational capability and how we want to go uh, to backfill that capability in the future uh, and to contain the cost on a replacement ballistic missile submarine, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, uh, one question about the, um, given the current situation the economy's in, it seems there's commodity prices have dropped, labor prices have dropped. Um, in terms of acquisition, how have we benefited from that in terms of a reduction in cost? Okay, let, let me uh, describe a couple of things. Uh, you said commodity and labor. In, in fact, uh, we are not seeing a reduction in labor costs. Um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that. Commodities, commodities have come down significantly. Um, when you look at where they were one to two years ago versus where they are today. Um, now, Commodities in terms of, of shipbuilding, as an example, represent a small percentage of the total cost of the ship. So whether you're talking steel, pipe, cable, you're in the less than 5% total cost of the ship for the raw material. So we are going after those benefits, but they aren't appreciably changing the cost of the ships. On the labor side, it's a more complex equation. When, when we look at labor and labor rates, they're affected by several, several factors. One is the direct wage that you, play, uh, that you pay to the worker. And uh, that direct wage uh, goes up with the cost of, uh, cost of living and, uh, or uh, labor union agreements that are contracts between the shipyards and the labor unions. Those have been going up at a, at a steady, uh, predictable rate. And so, in fact, what we have with the shipyards are what are called forward pricing rate agreements that account for that. Second major component associated with uh, those rates is the overhead and indirects. Overhead is associated with the facilities costs that uh, the shipyard is operating. So they have a cost that comes back in their pricing for such factors as appreciation or uh, capital expenses that get spread out over the term of the equipment. And then you have the indirect costs, would it, which would include such things as uh, insurance, health insurance, uh, a number of those factors that, again, are not coming down. Those are going up. So when, when I look at the categories that you just described, Commodities, we're going after it. It's not having the big bang because commodities don't represent a large percentage of the cost. And then uh, rates, we don't have much influence. I'm going I'm to say, frankly, we don't have influence on the direct wages that are going to the workers or some of the indirects. But what we do have the ability to go after are the overheads. And so I have spent time with the CEOs of our shipyards attacking that issue, that much of our overhead was sized for larger throughput than what we've got today. Okay. Some of these facilities go back to the buildup of the 80s. Some of them have been drawn down over time. Some of them have recapitalized. But what we have to do is ensure that the shipyards that are building our ships are right sized for the production that we've got going through them to bring that overhead down. It doesn't happen quickly. So we have to work closely with, with those shipyards to be able to drive that overhead rate down. The piece you didn't talk about 
when you said you mentioned commodities and rates, was the rest of the material cost, in this case for ships. And, and that is where you start to get into uh, equipments, components, hardware. Um, uh, that is not coming down with the price of commodities because that, in fact, brings a lot of touch labor to it. And it's typically highly skilled touch labor when you talk about whether it's gas turbine engine or whether it's a common equipment enclosure for electronics. In that case, what we have to look at is, uh, for commonality as an example, where we try to drive uh, common equipments, get the benefit of economic order quantities to get at that material cost. So we're tackling the equipments, commodities. We don't have the bang for the buck that uh, that we would. Uh, you might look to see based on what's happening with economic rates, and we're going after overheads. Well, it seems like what you mentioned earlier was a lack of competition. It seems like that is a factor in the fact that we haven't been right-sizing in terms of capacity. Uh, there are certain cases where you don't have competition. And so we, uh, we have to work, we have to use other methods to attack some of the cost structure in the non-competitive environment. But even in those cases, you go after the material underneath of the prime, if you will. So if you have a shipyard that is the only shipyard building that type of ship, you have to go after the whole cost structure, which includes everything that he buys, and drive competition down throughout the program. Where we do have competition has proved to be extremely effective in uh, uh, motivating uh, a focus on cost performance. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from New York, Captain Massa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have no questions at this time. Chair then recognizes the uh, Ms. Pingree. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. General Lady from Maine. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate both your service and your testimony this morning. And uh, as you probably know, I'm one of the newer members of this committee, just elected in November, but I represent the 1st Congressional District of Maine, so Bath Ironworks is in my district, and we're very proud of the work that they do and uh, their ability to work with you. Um, honestly, much of uh, what I'm concerned about, of course, is the size of the future Navy. Some of these questions have already been posed to you, and I appreciate your answers. I know that much of this won't come up until the quadrennial review, but we are very anxious, of course, to make sure that the industrial capacity, not only for, our, for my district, but just generally in the shipbuilding industry, um, continues to grow, that uh, we have the competition in the business, but also we have the, the business going on of building ships. Uh, for us, the opportunity to continue to build um, ships is important. The plan right now uh, uh, clearly works well for us to build the DDG 1000s and to be in line to go back to building the DDG 51s. But I just want to hear you talk a little bit more about that from our perspective. I, I know that uh, uh, we had Admiral Ruffhead visit our district recently um, uh, to launch our most recent ship and, and talked about the capacity of BIW and the quality of our work. And frankly, I just want to hear you say it again and say <laughs> that this is important to us, that industrial capacity is important, uh, that we will be hearing more, as, as has been asked uh, today and was asked previously. In, in our hearing yesterday about, uh, you know, continuing to build ships and the importance of yards and not losing that capacity as we see uh, our workforce being downsized and, and some of the issues that have gone in the, on in the past, which I think is bad for national security, bad for the manufacturing capacity of this country and, and worrisome about the future. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, let, me, let me first say that uh, uh, I was at that uh, christening with uh, Admiral Ruffhead and I, uh, I was able in my remarks to bring to everybody's, uh, bring back to everybody the statement, Bath Build is best built. It's not just a That's logo. That's favorite statement. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, tattooed in the hearts and minds of every worker up there. Uh, and, and I say that with all, all sincerity. Um, a couple of quick comments. We, we just talked about competition, how important competition is. When we look at surface combatants, uh, Bath Ironworks, North of Grumman have been our surface combatant builders uh, uh, for my life. And uh, um, what we see is we see a very robust competition between the two, not just in terms of, of cost, but in terms of, of innovation. And when I, look at, when I look at the land level facility at Bath Iron Works, 
and the investment uh, to that really turned the corner uh, in terms of their performance, that was driven by competition. And uh, so when, when we look forward to uh, future construction of surface combatants, I look forward to continued competition. The, uh, uh, the chairman made reference to the agreement uh, between uh, uh, the Navy, Northrop Grumman, and Bath Iron Works. An important uh, uh, part of that agreement, which uh, builds the three DDG-1000s at BIW, is the stability that it brings to that shipyard. We are able to uh, address uh, what was a concern associated with future workload and at the same time take advantage of, of three ships, one learning curve, one shipyard, which is uh, uh, good for the Navy, good for the nation, and just happens to be good for Bath Iron Works. And if I could, ma'am, uh, let there be no confusion that the, the, the CNO stated in his testimony, and I'll state it here. Uh, the minimum number of ships to execute the maritime strategy, uh, global maritime strategy for the 21st century is 313. Uh, we've said that uh, repeatedly. Uh, CNO stands by that. I stand by that. And, and that's what we need. Uh, and so that's a minimum of 313 ships. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your thoughts. And again, that, that's been brought up several times uh, since I've been on this committee, this concern that while there is a commitment to increasing the size of the ships, and 313 is the number, um, the current plan does not look like we're going to get there. So I know there's a lot of talk about that being in the quadrennial review. I just want to say I'm, I'm anxious to see that and make sure that we do continue to reinforce that capacity. And um, just to add a note, I, I, I'm glad you brought up the land level facility. And uh, I think that's another important factor about Bath Iron Works. I served in the state legislature at the time when the state made that commitment, the state of Maine help to build that part of the facility to modernize it. And so this is a commitment that not only is part of the, the companies that work there and the workers that work there, but our state too. We, we clearly recognize this is important to us and to the industrial capacity of our nation and to the future of the Navy. So we appreciate this partnership and look forward to it continuing. Uh, let, me, let me go a little bit out of bounds here and, and talk a bit further on that because that land level facility represents a couple of things. It was the result of competition, basically GD Bath Ironworks knew that they had to do something different or they weren't <laughs> staying in the game. But it was also the result of stability and a multi-year procurement that gave them the ability to commit the investment to the facility where they knew that they would get the return on investment. So we have competition, stability, and a solid acquisition approach that resulted in driving down the cost as well as uh, delivering to the Navy what it needed in terms of ships on schedule and on budget. Well, thank you. It seems to have been a successful plan, and I, I can guarantee you we're committed in our state to continuing uh, to be innovative and, and bring down costs and deliver best built ships on time. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Chair, thanks to the gentleman from Maine. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Stackley, Admiral McCullough, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for your service to our nation. Admiral McCullough, I'll begin with you. The other day when uh, Admiral Mullen came to testify before us concerning uh, the authorization process, one of the questions I asked him was concerning the proposal to go from 11 carriers down to 10 carriers. And I have a couple of questions along those lines for you. Is it the Navy's intention to ask for a change in the law, which presently requires 11 carriers, or a waiver? And if so, it looks like that drop from 11 to 10 would take place, according to Admiral Mullen, in the years 14 and 15 for about a 24-month period. Can you tell me if you believe that that is going to have a strategic impact on this nation's naval capabilities? And if so, uh, what are the contingencies that you would put in place to make sure that there is not a drop or a gap in the strategic uh, capability of this nation? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, what we need to do is take Enterprise uh, out of service on time. And she's supposed to go out of service uh, in November of 2012. Uh, that carrier will be about 47 years old. Uh, as you well know, it's an eight-reactor ship, one of a kind. Uh, and it was our nation's uh, ability to try to put nuclear power to sea in an aircraft carrier that drove the design and construction of Enterprise. Uh, and it was very successful. And it served in everything from the Cuban Missile Crisis 
uh, to recently in uh, the Arabian Sea and the uh, Arabian Gulf. Uh, the, sh the ship needs to be retired on schedule. So the waiver we request is to be able to decommission Enterprise uh, and inactivate Enterprise uh, in November 2012. Now that will lead us to a, a 10 uh, carrier level uh, until the delivery of a Ford uh, CVN 78, which is scheduled for September of 2015. Uh, and so uh, the question, can we mitigate our uh, operational availability of the nation's aircraft carriers uh, during that period? Uh, yes, sir, we can. Uh, we've moved some availabilities forward, uh, PS, uh, for the aircraft carriers or maintenance availabilities. Uh, and we've moved some uh, to the right uh, in order to produce that operational availability to, to meet the commitment of the Navy to the nation during that time frame. Uh, I'd also tell you that if we don't take Enterprise out and uh, the direction is to keep her in service and we have to put her in the dock uh, to do the maintenance required uh, to, to continue that ship in service beyond 2012, uh, it significantly disrupts uh, the refueling uh, schedules for the remaining Nimitz class carriers. Uh, the one immediately impacted in that time frame is Abraham Lincoln uh, CVN 72. Uh, when Lincoln comes home from her last deployment prior to uh, her currently scheduled refueling availability, uh, she is out of, out of gas, if you will. Uh, so if we put Enterprise in the dock uh, to do the maintenance availability on her to get her beyond 2012, uh, not only do you have that aircraft carrier out of service, uh, you can't get any more operational availability out of Nimitz because she's or out of uh, Lincoln because she's out of fuel. Uh, and then each subsequent refueling would would be delayed. Now, uh, that's a there's a compounding factor associated with that because now you have to retain Enterprise after she comes home from a deployment after the maintenance availability. So if she went into that maintenance availability in 2012, she got one deployment's worth of fuel left in her. So if she deploys, she comes home. Now because we've delayed the refueling availabilities of Lincoln and beyond, we have no, uh, no place to fit her in to do her inter inactivation availability. Uh, it's a nuclear-powered warship. Uh, you, you can't lay it up and put uh, a very reduced crew on it. You have to keep the crew on it to maintain the propulsion plant. And so now we've got this carrier set aside with no operational availability at it, uh, out of it, uh, maintaining a crew uh, of around 2,000 people on it, uh, which have to, have to be there and can't contribute to the Navy elsewhere. And we looked at taking those people out and putting them on a the follow-on ship. So the answer is we need re legislative relief to take Enterprise out of service on time, and we can mitigate the operational availability. Would that uh, legislative relief be in the form of a waiver or a request to change the law? Uh, I think it's in a form of a waiver uh, w was what the legislative proposal was. I'll, I'll get back to you on that for sure. I don't want to sit here and, and uh, uh, sort of give you a half answer. Okay. Uh, but the nation, as I said in my opening statement, is committed to, a, or the Navy is committed to 11 aircraft carriers uh, for the next three decades. And uh, Secretary Gates was clear on that when he talked about moving the build cycle to five-year centers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentleman for a great question and, and wants to compliment the Admiral on a uh, excellent answer. I appreciate it for the sake of the committee you walking us through that. Chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Ellsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being late. If these questions were already answered, I apologize to you all. Um, I was in a meeting. I heard uh, Secretary Stackley say that our favorite saying. I, heard, I was in a meeting with the President about three weeks ago, and he said that at some point, we have to start making uh, decisions on national defense based on national defense. I hope that's up there in the top uh, of our favorite sayings also, because I think that's very true. I'm going to ask three questions, hopefully from the short answer up to the, the longer answer. Um, my first question is, when we plan to announce the propulsion system for our, for our cruisers? Um, if you'll think about that one, if you can give me an answer on that. Um, the second, I'd like your... Um, your thoughts and plans on um, spare long lead reactor parts, uh, addressing that issue. And thirdly, and what might take the longer answer, is um, that Secretary Gates announced in April about going to the five-year uh, building procurement on, on the carrier. 
And I'd like the, the justification and, and logic on that and what that might do to the price of these carriers. And if, it, if you can get all three of those in, in my five minutes, I'd appreciate it uh, if possible. Okay, let me, uh, let me start with the question regarding the propulsion system for the cruiser. The uh, uh, cruiser, as uh, Admiral McCullough alluded to earlier, uh, is outside of the fit-up. And uh, I don't want to try to pin down a date right now. Let me, let me simply state it's outside of the fit-up. What we're doing in terms of preparing for the cruiser is identifying what the capabilities are that are required to not just meet the mission, but we're also projecting the threat, if you will. So the, the immediate work that's going on that that's follow up to the analysis of alternatives that was done about a year ago that's continuing to be reviewed is to identify the capabilities and the system, uh, system and technology developments that are needed for that cruiser. That will inform what the requirements are, the, the larger hull mechanical and electrical requirements are for the ship in terms of uh, electrical power, propulsion, size, displacement, etc. With that information, then, then you start to get into the design cycle for the propulsion plant or the integrated propulsion plant, which would also bring your, your power systems. So we don't have sufficient fidelity for those requirements to start serious analysis, if you will, for the propulsion plant. Absent that, what we are doing is feasibility studies. So we're quite mindful of the, uh, of the NDAA re requirement that the future cruiser would be nuclear powered. Um, uh, we, ha we have to have greater fidelity in terms of what size, shape, what it's going to look like, what it's going to operate. Uh, uh, to be able to come back to the committee and provide any specifics regarding our analysis. So in our, terms of our feasibility, what we're doing is taking existing propulsion plants, CVN 78 design, and uh, scaling, if you will. What would half of a CVN 78 propulsion plant mean in terms of size of ship uh, required, if you will, to drive that around? And do we have a match or do we have a mismatch with the systems and capabilities required for the future cruiser to meet its requirements uh, against the future threat? Okay. The, the second question regarding spare long lead reactor plants uh, parts, um, we do have a very um, unique uh, and somewhat fragile industrial base associated with uh, U.S. Navy reactor plants. And so we are very mindful, very careful to uh, try to avoid peaks and valleys regarding workload associated with whether it's carriers or submarines. And uh, uh, we use advanced procurement, if you will, to try to help smooth out uh, the workload there. Um, so. Regarding long lead, I think we have a very uh, healthy long lead advanced procurement plan for our nuclear powered ships. Regarding spare reactor plant parts, uh, I, I would have to get back to you on that. I don't know that we are not properly spared uh, in that case. And, and thirdly, just the, the justification logic with the four to five year uh, announcement on, on the carrier procurement, what that's yes. going to do, add to the cost, take away from the cost, how that works into the goal of the 313 ships. Well, let me, I think the justification is, is more of a requirements issue. I'll just quickly touch on the, uh, the cost considerations. Um, when we look at uh, Newport News and its, its workload uh, for what was to be a 2012 carrier and is now uh, projecting to be a 2013 carrier, at that same point in time, we will have an RCOH ongoing at Newport News, and we're into the two boat per year phase for the Virginia class. So there's, there's in fact, a lot of activity, a lot of work going into Newport News in that period of time. The impact on costs would be, uh, as I was discussing earlier, the effect on overheads associated with uh, pulling work to the right, as well as the effect associated with inflation when you delay procurements an additional year. So we use advanced procurement. Uh, we have an opportunity to use advanced procurement to offset some of those escalation impacts, and we're going to work around 
the other uh, work going on in the shipyard at the time, completion of CVN 78, ramping up to two submarines per year on the Virginia class and the RCOH to try to minimize the cost impacts. Uh, and uh, I'm not at this point able to give you uh, a good assessment of that because we're still going through all the puts and takes and we, uh, it will be significantly impacted by the, uh, uh, the, le the lead stream that we put into the CVN 79. Thank, thank you, Mr. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, sure, thanks to the gentleman. Uh, Secretary Stackley, I, I think you're hearing uh, a lot of interest on the part of the members of this committee, a lot of concern about the industrial base, and I think you are hearing a willingness on the part of this subcommittee to make investments in our yards if we can turn around and tell the American people by, that by making taxpayer investments in these yards, we're getting a better ship, quicker, greater capability, and above all, a better price for the taxpayer at the end of the day. I was curious what type of initiatives that, that you have in mind that we could help you with legislatively towards that end. Uh, yes, sir. Let me, let me uh, first walk through the way we uh, incentivize investments today. Uh, I, I, I gave the generic discussion on competition. Competition basically drives uh, shipyards to figure out how to get cost out, which means invest, investing in, in uh, facilities to improve their performance. Uh, ship, uh, ship construction is, is labor intensive and it's capital intensive. So what that means is heavy front end load in terms of facilities, tooling, machinery, uh, uh, that gets written off over time on ship construction contracts. So what we do there is we, we do a couple of things. We, they have the ability to depreciate on their contracts, their, their investments. As well, we provide what's called the facilities cost capital of money. If they tie money up into facilities, we allow that to come back on the contracts. Uh, we replace the equivalent earnings of that money that got tied up into facilities. And then going beyond that, what we've done uh, is we've opened up what we refer to as capital expenditure incentives, where we put incentives in the programs uh, uh, where the shipyard identifies a return on investment. We pay the front end in an incentive. When he demonstrates the return on investment, then we pay the back end in terms of incentives. If I may, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate everything you said, but since most of our shipyards operate on basically a cost plus basis, what incentive do they have to identify that saving? I, I would, I'm going to disagree, and I, I think it is our job as a nation to identify those things and point it out to the shipyard rather than the other way around. Yes, sir. Um, That's what purchasing agents do for a company. Yes, sir. Let me try to, let me clarify um, in terms of most of our shipyards working on a cost plus. I, I think what we have is most of our ship construction contracts right now are fixed price type contracts. But we buy ships one year at a time. So when a shipyard is trying to make this, or a, a corporation is trying to decide whether or not to make a significant capital investment to reduce its cost even if it's a fixed price type contract, it has to be able to convince itself that it will get the return on investment, not just this year, but guessing what will happen in the out years. So in terms of the government as the customer, as the buyer, what we have to do is work with industry to try to either offset the risk associated with an investment up front with nothing on the back end to justify it, uh, and we try to do that through some through incentives, some through the way we uh, buy our ships. And uh, uh, frankly, we struggle um, to get to things like multi-year procurements where when you lay in a multi-year, you're laying in potentially five years worth of known quantity of work, and that will drive him to invest on the front end to get the return over the five years. Those are the tools that we have in hand today. Uh, we have uh, chartered a separate group to do an independent assessment regarding investments, uh, uh, costs and investments in our shipyards. 
and uh, uh, the facts come to bear that uh, there are investments pretty much across the board where there is either a healthy front end, uh, stable workload, or competition to drive the investments. Um, what we don't have is a tool where we would go in and pay direct for a shipyard to upgrade its facilities. That starts to go down a path where you, when you look at the industrial base, how would you meter that out? How would you decide where, you, where the government makes its investments, where the government will get the return on investments across the broad industry? It's a challenge. It's a challenge, Mr. Secretary, but I think it's your job to do that, quite honestly. And we, I don't say this happily, but we are in a situation where our six major shipyards have one customer. That's the United States government, whether it's the United States Navy, United States Coast Guard, they've got one customer. And as that customer, I think, in, with the responsibility of 300 million people to defend them, but at a price that's reasonable, I, I cannot encourage you enough to take those steps to identify those procedures, come to this committee with your recommendations, and then put the responsibility on us to make a pitch to the rest of the Congress to make those things happen. And sure. I, I think you're the man to do that, and I hope you will do that. So I'll take a fraction. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to Mr. Ellsworth's questions, I, um, it is the committee's dis decision to try to work with the Navy on the LCS program. I believe the committee is uh, in agreement with the CNO as far as the DDG-51. The, uh, the fact of the matter is they're both extremely capable warships, but they're both gas guzzlers. Uh, last summer, when gasoline prices were $4 a gallon, this committee responded by saying that the next generation of amphibious assault ships would be nuclear powered. The year before that, when gasoline was about $3 a gallon, this committee decided that the next generation of cruisers would be nuclear powered. I'm of the opinion that gasoline is temporarily down. I'm of the opinion that when the world economy recovers, that price is going to go back up and that uh, I'm told that the next uh, typical cruiser uses about 10 million gallons of fuel per ship per year. So since I believe it is inevitable that the price is going up, that it is a military vulnerability to have warships that need to be refueled every three to five days and that you can remove that vulnerability with a nuclear powered ship. I must express my disappointment in the Navy's decision to uh, delay the building of the CGX. I would also like to hear your thoughts on what, uh, what steps you're taking when we build the nuclear powered cruiser to use the common propulsion plant that's going into the uh, Ford carrier, the A1B, in order to not only get some economies of scale on the manufacturing side, but also get economies of scale within the Navy on your training. Yes, sir. Let me start with the uh, uh, last question there on the, uh, uh, the Ford class propulsion plant. As I was uh, discussing earlier, uh, uh, the CGX R&D funding that we do have, uh, uh, the piece of that that is associated with the propulsion plant is doing feasibility studies, taking exactly a look at the Ford plant, scaling it in half, and trying to come to grips with what that means in terms of a total ship. We don't, we don't design a ship around a propulsion plant, but uh, uh, the propulsion plant will start to put some uh, limitations, if you will, on the ship design. So. We've got a known configuration. We're figuring out what does it mean to scale it in half, and then what does that mean in terms of driving length, beam, displacement for a cruiser, while separately uh, we're attacking the issue associated with technology and systems uh, development and design to meet the requirement, the, the capability warfighting requirement for that cruiser. What, Mr. Secretary, what would be the, what is the Navy's reluctance to just go ahead and make that decision, to say it's going to be an A-1B, and yes, we're going to build a ship around this power plant? Well, the, you start with requirements. Going, going back to your earlier comments about the problem of having at one point, I think, 12 different ships under construction and all the yes, initial sir. costs that went with that. If you've got a power plant that you believe works, 
We all know there are economies of scale and, and that he, there are huge benefits to sticking with something that you know works. I'd, I'd like you to walk the committee through why your reluctance, not just to say that's going to be the power plant. Yes, sir. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll start by offering follow-up in terms of a classified briefing, but in an unclassified setting, let me walk through, uh, and, and Admiral McCullough might, might jump in here as well, where we are in terms of the AOA for the CGX. The AOA was uh, conducted a year plus ago, and there were two parts to the AOA, one part associated with uh, uh, the capability that's required to meet the mission, to defeat the threat, and the other part of the AOA was the platform that would carry the capability. A, a couple significant issues emerge. Uh, first and foremost is uh, cost uh, and, and size of the systems that are required for that mission. So that's, uh, that informs a, uh, a decision that the CGX needs to move outside of the fit-up. We can't get there from here in the time where the, <coughs> where the CGX was showing up in the budget. So the platform moves outside of the fit-up while we look at not just developing the technologies, but how do we best go after this threat because we cannot get there based on the costs that emerged from the AOA we have to look at other alternatives. So the nuclear power plant piece of that discussion is really tied to the platform piece while we tackle the more difficult issue of how do we get the threat, what technologies do we need, <coughs> it goes beyond a single platform, it goes beyond a CGX discussion. The, the, uh, the reason uh, for one of the reasons for the slip of the uh, cruiser, Mr. Chairman, was uh, how much radar do we need in the ship? Uh, and uh, some of this I'll have to take offline with you, but uh, if you look at not only ship-based sensors, but land-based sensors and overhead sensors uh, and put them together in the right network, what size uh, capability or sensitivity radar do you need to put on a ship? Uh, and as we worked through that, we saw no clear path to get to the capability we needed in the sensor for the ship uh, that would get that ship built inside the fit-up. And so what pushed the ship outside the fit-up uh, was, was no debate over the engineering plant. It was what size and sensitivity sensor do we need and what can we, what can we rely on from other sensors to mitigate the size of the one we'd have to put on a ship? Uh, and as Mr. Stackley uh, has said, the plant, if uh, when we looked at nuclear power plant options, the plant that would go in that ship is a variant of the A1B power plant uh, because we have that designed and we would not want to commit a, a, a commit a vast amount of money to redesign another power plant uh, to put inside the ship. But what we really don't know is because we haven't yet defined the sensor, we don't know what the electric generation capacity is that will be needed to drive the combat system in that ship. And until we can bring all the pieces of the puzzle together, uh, we don't know what the length beam uh, and the displacement of the ship will be and what the power density requirements to drive that combat system and to propel the ship through the water will be. Uh, and so we're working our way through that. Uh, if, if you look at the tankage required for an extremely high-powered radar uh, in a fossil-fueled ship, uh, you also look at, have to look at uh, what the rotation rate would be from that ship being on station and have to go alongside an oiler to refuel. And so what's the operational, true operational availability of the platform because you're going to have to take it offline to refuel it. So the cost of uh, fuel aside, uh, it gets down to really what the power density requirements are. And we just haven't sorted that out yet. Uh, and we're working hard to get through it. Question. Uh, so. 
So that's so that's where we are, sir. Okay. Chair, gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, just one question in general, because I think the chairman has raised a very critical point uh, in terms of uh, the logistical complexity, uh, as well as the long-term cost of of relying upon conventional fuels. Uh, is it that in the short run that, that the capital cost of, of a nuclear power plant is more expensive than a conventional power plant Th in that, addition to the issues that you've raised? Uh, that's, that's something we consider, sir, but in the end you have to look at the, the total ownership cost of the ship uh, and a li or the life cycle cost of the ship. And when you make an upfront investment uh, in a nuclear propulsion plant, it will add cost, acquisition cost to the ship. But then as you look at the projected cost of fuel over the life of that ship, and if we're going to build a ship that we're looking at, we're looking at a 50-year service life on this ship, similar to an aircraft carrier, uh, what would be the life cycle cost to operate that ship using fossil fuel? So it's not, we don't just look at it from an upfront acquisition cost. I mean, obviously that's an input. But we try to look at it from a total ownership cost, and, and that, that easily uh, mitigates uh, the upfront cost of nuclear power if you look at what we think the ship would require if it requires the high-end radar. What, one of the CNO's uh, priorities is fuel. If you look at the rate at which we consume fuel, it, it's, uh, it's both logistics and its cost. And so across the board, Navy, Navy systems platforms are attacking our fuel consumption rates. So we're looking, you look at aircraft, you look at ships, you look at ground vehicles, we're trying to figure out how to get a better handle on the rate at which we're consuming fuel. And, and to add on to that, we're looking at alternative fuels, not just fossil-based fuels. Uh, and we'd like to get, get to what we call the Green Hornet uh, sometime in the near term that runs off a non-petroleum-based fuel. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral McCuller, I'll go, go back on another issue concerning our carriers, and I know that uh, I appreciate the, the Navy's um, willingness in the decision-making process for, for home porting uh, to make that decision through uh, the QDR process. I do, though, have a couple of questions that do seem to create some contradictions, and I'd like for you to just elaborate a little bit on that. I see in the Navy's justification book that it clearly indicates that future projects at Mayport would include a controlled industrial facility, ship maintenance support facilities, and other construction projects that would be necessary only if a carry were home ported there in Mayport. So I wanted you to maybe explain to me, is there maybe a disconnect there or an updating that's needed in the justification book between the budget planning process and the decision deferral, and then also the request for $76 million for dredging and dockside improvements there at Mayport uh, that, again, uh, you would question knowing that there are other ports in the nation where they could accommodate a nuclear carry on an emergency basis and certainly that 76 million might lead you to believe that there is the beginning of an effort there to create a permanent uh, home porting facility there at Mayport. So I was wondering if you couldn't, couldn't comment on those. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, as, as we look at uh, carrier facilities uh, on the east and west coast, there are three uh, bases, if you will, on the West Coast that can accommodate a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in Nimitz class. Uh, on the East Coast, we currently have one, and that's Norfolk. Uh, so we believe that it's in the nation's best interest to have an alternate carrier facility on the East Coast to include both the ability uh, to berth the aircraft carrier there and to service it as required if something would preclude getting in and out of Norfolk. Uh, as, sir, as you well know, the carriers won't fit through the Panama Canal. So if something happened and we couldn't get a carrier in, and out of Nor in or out of Norfolk for some period of time uh, and the ship was coming home and from deployment and required service and uh, based on the current distribution of bases, we'd have to send it around South America to get it to a West Coast uh, facility. So we believe it's in the nation's interest to have an alternate capability on the East Coast and that we believe the easiest place to do that is in Mayport where the Navy has had aircraft carriers based uh, since, I believe, about 1952 until Kennedy was decommissioned. Uh, to get that ship in that turning basin with that um, adequate bottom clearance requires dredging, even to tie that ship up in Mayport. Uh, and that's what's in the budget request today. Uh, the pier work in Mayport is not particularly associated with, that's in the budget this year, the budget request this year, is not 
associated with an alternate carrier facility. That, that amount of money was in the budget for other pier work uh, in Mayport uh, to support the ships that are currently there. Uh, part of the, uh, as we looked at the requirement for Mayport, uh, as you suggest, if we're going to truly have an alternate carrier facility on the East Coast, uh, you'd need the ship's maintenance facility and the consolidated industrial facility to support the nuclear work. Uh, we'd additionally need to uh, do further upgrades uh, to the wharf in Mayport. Uh, so given we're going to look at carrier basing and global force dispersal or, or deployment, rather, uh, in the QDR, uh, we think it's in the nation and the Navy's best interest to proceed with the dredging project uh, to at least have an adequate facility to berth a carrier in Mayport should we need to do that. Uh, I know there's other ports on the East Coast uh, that, pe that various folks think you could uh, uh, put an aircraft carrier in. And I've heard mentioned at Charleston, South Carolina, and Baltimore. Uh, the sea detail going in and out of Charleston in the Cooper River uh, with the flow and shape of the Cooper River uh, is difficult for attack submarine and cruiser destroyer type ships. Uh, having served on Enterprise for 26 months and been the commander of two carrier strike groups, uh, I would not want to have to live through that sea detail on a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. I've also heard of Baltimore, uh, and while the Baltimore ship channel going up the bay, I believe, is dredged to a depth of 50 feet, uh, having taken uh, a DDG 10,000-ton uh, destroyer uh, to Annapolis, I, again, uh, would not wish that sea detail on anybody uh, to put a nuclear-powered air or try to get a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier into Baltimore. So given all those factors, uh, the Navy came uh, to the conclusion uh, that Mayport is uh, probably the best alternative for uh, an additional carrier facility on the East Coast. Just, just as a follow up on that, it sounds like then from what you're telling me is that the Navy's pretty much got their mind made up prior to going into the QDR then that Mayport's going to be the place and that we're, we're essentially ramping up for that by the first phase with this $76 million uh, improvement there. I, I'd say we need, we need a capability. I think the dredging is a first start, uh, but uh, but the Navy and the Defense Department uh, uh, believe that needs to be looked at in a QDR. And while I have some idea what the projects proposed in Mayport are, uh, if the QDR decides that that's not the appropriate place to put the aircraft carrier, then we'll revisit the whole issue. Okay. All right. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Maine, Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hadn't really intended to ask you about this, but since I had this opportunity and and uh, a chance to ask another question. Um, not only do I have a BIW in my district, but I have the Kittery Portsmouth Naval Shipyard where we, we you know, reconditioned submarines. And I'm kind of interested. I, I, I've only had one opportunity to visit there, but it seemed like there was a tremendous amount of work going on and the need for a fair amount of construction to handle the capacity. It looked to me like there was more work than they could handle in spite of the um, excellent workforce. And I know they're hiring more and, and doing more, but I didn't know if you wanted to just talk a little bit about um, the need for that capacity and what's going on there. Um, let, me, let me describe a couple of things. We've, we have recently uh, submitted in a report to Congress what's referred to as the Shipyard Business Plan, which takes a look at uh, uh, public-private, the division of work going into the public shipyards, and then how do we uh, plan and manage that workload to ensure that we're meeting our public-private requirements as well as ensuring that our shipyards are efficiently loaded. And at Portsmouth, and I'll, I'll, I'll get the number exactly wrong, but I would say that there's uh, the, uh, what we call full-time equivalents for workload at Portsmouth it looks fairly stable at the four, roughly 4,000 uh, uh, per year rate. In, in, the, uh, in the repair world, uh, particularly uh, in Portsmouth's world where most of their work all of their work is submarine, but most of their workload was tied to refuelings. And, and as we move, uh, as we have moved out of uh, 688 refuelings and have gone to Virginia where you don't have a midlife refueling plan, then it becomes more of a challenge. And so uh, what we're trying to do is balance that uh, skill level, 4,000, to a workload to ensure we're not operating the shipyard inefficiently. Um, and it will be a continual challenge. Okay. 
sir. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, the ranking member. Yeah, we're starting to run along here, but I just had one quick question or concern, and that was um, having been in charge of maintenance in a steel mill, I know when there's a lot of budget pressure, it's easy to sort of shave off the maintenance budget. Certainly the last number of weeks, we have been sensitive to a lot of budgetary pressures. Uh, in addition, I believe that uh, a lot of the maintenance requirements have been sort of moved uh, out of the public domain in a way. Uh, I guess it's just a, a thought or a concern that we make sure that, you know, you're, you're trying to keep a 300-something ship Navy. You've got to keep up on the maintenance, too. I hope that that's being balanced carefully. and It, it might be something we need to look at uh, just to make sure that we're not shaving that too tight. But yes, just, yes, sir. And, and, and Mr. Thank, Chairman. Thanks very much for that, that statement. Uh, we look at maintenance very carefully. Uh, and as we talk about a 313 ship floor, uh, as we go forward, uh, two thirds of that 313 sitting at the pier right now. And if we don't get our ships to their estimated service lives, we'll never achieve the 313 floor structure plan. Uh, we, we uh, in, in the current budget request, uh, we've funded or requested funding for surface ship maintenance to a level of 96 percent of what we perceive the requirement is. Uh, and when we looked at uh, the entire portfolio uh, and the risk we were taking with respect to procurement and manpower and ops and maintenance, uh, that 4 percent we believed was acceptable risk. Uh, but, but absolutely, sir, we, we look at that. Uh, we think it's very important uh, to do the right maintenance on the ships at the right times. And I would tell you, as part of our 09 execution year challenge, uh, we've uh, curtailed some operations to continue to fund uh, maintenance availabilities. Uh, and that's the way we view that, sir. I appreciate your keeping that kind of balance, the whole thing, because there's so much pressure for platforms and new technology and all that kind of thing. But you got to keep the, and as you know, if you let maintenance get away from you, then it can really eat you alive because you, you, it's a, a preventive thing. and. You didn't catch it early, and now you've got to tear something all to pieces in order to get into some part you've got to change. So, Yes, sir, I understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, the ranking member. Gentlemen, I want to uh, compliment you on what I think has been a, one of the better presentations that I've seen in my time in Congress. Secretary Stackley, I think we're lucky as a nation to have you where you are, and I would leave you with just one last thought. I'm always amazed at the, uh, at the caliber of our officer corps and our enlisted corps. Um, we are, as, as a nation, are blessed. I think, though, that over the years, the, the most glaring weakness in our Department of Defense has been the acquisition force. It has been my observation that a, a, a grounding, no matter how slight, is a career-ending move for a ship captain. I would hope that a program that runs over budget or fails to be delivered on time that we as a nation would take the same attitude towards those programs, that we could instill in our acquisition force the need to, with a nation that's going to run a trillion dollar deficit this year, and with a series of programs that have run late and well over budget, I would hope that one of your goals would be to get within your acquisition force that type of a mentality that we're going to be on time, we're going to be on budget, and we're going to get the best value for the fleet, for the sailors, and for the people who pay for that. Sir, can I offer a Absolutely, comment? Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me first say that, uh, we, yes, sir, we have absolutely, uh, uh, we have to change course in terms of where we're going regarding cost and scheduled performance on our major defense acquisition programs. As far as the caliber of the individuals that you have working for you day in, day out to achieve that, we have top-notch individuals working hard. One of the challenges that we face is that in the course of the past 15 years, we've taken the acquisition workforce and reduced it by 55 percent. So now what you've done is you've taken hardworking individuals and you stretched them way too thin. So the, the Congress recognizes that and the Department recognizes that. And we're taking the steps necessary to start the rebuild. The Department of the Navy has 5,000 acquisition uh, um, workforce members that we're going after in the fit-up. We've got it uh, identified in terms of critical skills, where do we need them placed, 
and we're actively going after getting the best folks we can to come into the government to help us take on that task. Now, Mr. Secretary, I, I, again, I think uh, we're lucky to have you where you are. I, I very much appreciate the attitude you're taking towards this, and we're going to work with you to make that happen. Thanks. If there are no other questions, then the subcommittee stands adjourned.